Welcome in folks, got a four piece for you here today. Buy one, get three free. First one up here, shelving model two for RoboTaxi. Could be a gamble that defines Tesla. What is Dan Ives talking about Tesla's done here, okay? Then we're getting into the professor, Jeremy Siegel. He's talking about where he sees the market going from here. I think that should be an interesting one to react to. Then we're getting into this one, the spike in the VIX this month. Hasn't been unexpected. All right, Melissa Lee working the morning shift at CNBC. What in the world's going on? And then the last one I want to react to, markets are following NVIDIA's lead. What does that mean? That should be an intriguing one to react to here today. Appreciate y'all joining me. I want to jump straight into this. All I need from you guys before we get into it, smash a like on this video, the thumbs up button, and also make sure you subscribe to this channel if you are not already. And also, congrats to the first few members of 1000X. we got a few uh, first members in 1000X. So very, very exciting. Alrighty, guys, let's get into this. Today is going to be a big day. You say the clock has struck midnight. And the line that stuck out to me, uh, trading in the Model 2 for Robo would be a tragic gamble, in your opinion. I, I think it would be a gamble that could maybe even define the future of Tesla in the next three to five years. And I think right now the big nervousness is Model 2, that's a key part of the growth, that's 50 to 60 percent of the incremental growth in the next two or three years. Robotaxi is autonomous, that's not for another five to six years. And I'd say, look, we've seen over the last decade, we've been through a lot of white knuckle moments from Musk and Tesla. This is up there. And this has really been a Cinderella story that in the near term has really turned into a nightmare on Elm Street. He, it all starts next Tuesday. Needs to control the narrative. Because if there's no adult in the room, there could be darker days ahead. So if, if, if he really does say, we're, we're, we're going to play this long game, and it's going to come at the expense of the two, you would re-rate? That would be, if that happened, it would be a disaster of epic proportions. Because in the near term, and you've seen others throw in the white towel because of the fears of that and because of some of the stuff that's reported, that would really put a massive black hole or gap in the growth for the next few years. And if you look at the last sort of 2015, 2018, there were levers that Musk could pull and ultimately did pull. And that's why it's, you know, you've seen the, the history. But this for the, I'd say for the first time in five, six years, long-term Tesla bulls are really calling, feels like they're about to hit the elevator if they don't hear what they want on Tuesday. Why are animals? Okay, okay. You know, sometimes we got to poke fun at the perma bears, right? Because they'll never, you know, even if you say, well, what if this happens, this happens, they never adjust their story. But wait a minute. We got to also per poke at the perma bulls like uh, Dan Ives here, okay? Because man just asked him, okay, if this happened, would you re rate the stock? And he just totally just wouldn't answer it, right? He just went on and said, well, that would be a disaster, investor, blah, 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 blah. And just totally bypassed it with his massive price target on the stock. And that's just, uh, that's very perma bullish activity. No different than when you say to a bear, well, what if inflation comes down, the Fed starts lowering? Would you change your stance? And they, they go take it to some somewhere else and they won't say, yeah, yeah, I would change my stance. It's just, you know, you got to understand like where people are at. And Dan Ives is definitely just a perma bull. Just like you and investors so downbeat on the prospect of the robo taxi future bullish on robo taxis bullish on autonomy the problem is this would be like cook on you know a may second coming out and being like okay iphone 15 now look we're not going to have anything till iphone 21 but trust us <laughs> thanks for being on the conference call so that's the problem is that we're bullish it's always worked term. for him before exactly and i think now the difference is you need a refresh competition come from all angles Game of Thrones that we're seeing in China. And the credibility for Musk has definitely been questioned because the last two conference calls we've talked about on the show, those have been train wreck horror shows. So this, it all comes down to clock struck midnight. Tuesday night, adult in the room needs to step up, navigate the story. And that's why we call it a fork in the road moment. We are still bullish on the long-term Tesla story, but this is a category five storm. And the pilot on the plane can't be Ted Stryker. But what, what, what to you, there, there's a lot of just analogies and stuff there. But what do, you, what do you want to hear? Because the China competition is not in Tesla's control. Yeah, you need to hear four things. One, what's the growth strategy in China? How are we going to reverse the trend that we're seeing in, in mainland China, which has been, we'll call it 60, 70% of, of the growth 
incremental growth story for Tesla. How do they do that? Those cars are cheaper. They're nice. I, I saw them on the streets. I tested them. H how are they going to reverse that kind of growth well, trend? Hold prices, hold margins. We're going to basically bet on our brand. No different than what Apple has done. And I think many others, including Microsoft, depending on the, on the products. But give the strategy there. What are the targets? And, and Sarah, they have to give guidance. What's the targets on growth realistically? What do margins look like? Where does it trough out at? AI, Musk, the 25% threat, recommit. Keeping AI within Tesla, showing FSD, showing autonomy. That's been the problem here is that if you had an adult in the room no, to hasn't navigate, been the problem. The stock, I think 30% of the sell-off here has really been Musk-driven, mm -hmm. but it all comes down to like you could talk to talk, guy walk to walk. Dan Ives, a perma bull, but at the same time just delusional on other things. He talks about Tesla in China like it's the worst thing ever, and they're just doomed, and they're just doing – I just showed you the best-selling vehicle last year. They got the mantle. They're the king in China. So, I mean, the way these people talk about Tesla in China, you would think they got the you know 25th best-selling vehicle over there, and it's just – I mean, you, they're number one. Is China extremely competitive? Sure. But they're still number one. Every market's extremely competitive for vehicles. So that's just utterly ridiculous. Absolutely utterly ridiculous. Then he makes out like all oh, the stock is, is down because of Elon Musk conference. Baloney. The stock is down because the company has deliveries numbers that are extremely disappointing based upon any historical standard for Tesla. That's why the stock is down. And people are looking at those delivery numbers and those production numbers, and they're like, don't see it getting better in the short term. That's why the stock is down. Not because of Elon Musk in conference calls or any of that baloney, okay? Now, there is one huge thing that Elon Musk could say on this conference call that would very positively affect the stock, and that would be if he basically commits to margins will go up in the back half of the year. If him and the management team say that, I think that's a huge factor for the stock overall. So just... Um, I don't know, man. I don't know what Dan Ives got going on there. All right, next one up here. The Professor Jeremy Siegel. Their finance. Jeremy Siegel joins us. Professor, do you think it's justified given what we've seen on rates, on geopolitics, headwinds piling up? Well, Sarah, we know we had an incredible steady rise from last October, almost record setting, not a 2% uh, uh, decline. And, and, you know, that actually is not healthy either because you get momentum players just jumping on the market. I, I think a little pullback. And by the way, I don't even think we have a 5%, which is the minimum definition of a pullback. But uh, a little bit of softening is certainly not uh, unhealthy for the market. I, I think we're going to get a good PCE deflator number uh, next, next week. Yeah. Uh, which uh, I think 2.7% uh, um, uh, will be the lowest in three years. And by the way, that's only three uh, tenths away from the year-end target uh, that the Fed set in March of 2.4% of for uh, that deflator. So I think, uh, yeah, we had three uh, disappointments on, on CPI. I think PCE will come in, and I think our CPIs are going to start coming in uh, in May and, and June. So, uh, and, and when we take a look at the futures, we've squeezed down to basically uh, one cut uh, uh, yeah. by December. I actually think that we could get more if we get these good uh, uh, deflator numbers uh, and inflation numbers. So I, I think, uh, you know, I, I still see gains uh, in the market uh, going forward this summer. I know that the PCE is the Fed's so-called preferred inflation measure, but the CPI has really captivated the attention of investors and of the Fed. You, you heard me go through all the reactions of these Fed members. They changed their tune after the March CPI report. So how are they going to explain, if you, if you think they'll be encouraged by a better PCE, which they should be, how do they explain that gap and how do they convince investors, the American public, themselves, that they're doing the right thing if, they, if they're cutting based on PCE. Right. Well, first of all, the, this, the CPI and, and, and the producer price index come out a couple weeks before the PCE. So it's the most informative data uh, that 
that economists and the Fed has to, to predicting that PCE. I look at the CPI much more importantly uh, also. But I see good trends if forward-looking in that CPI. Uh, for instance, we, we've talked about the fact that that shelter uh, sh actually shelter and in insurance are more than 50 percent of the last 12 months CPI core increase. And looking forward, both of those look very much more favorable, uh, particularly the shelter uh, 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 segment, which is 41 percent of the CPI core. Uh, so uh, looking forward, those those are those are very promising and important factors that could suppress the CPI, and that will feed into the PC deflator. So your view is we're going to get more cuts now than the market is expecting, and that's a good reason to buy stocks? Yeah. I mean, that. I think that now that, you know, we could all say at the beginning of the year the market was way over, way optimistic with four or five cuts. Now it's squeezed down to one. Um, and I actually think that we might get two or three uh, cuts by the end of the year. I don't think the Fed knows. I don't think really anyone knows. They follow just month by month what the data is. Um, and by the way, one thing that's important that, that Chairman Powell said, now he said there was disappointment in the, in the CPI. However, he did say we have a dual mandate. If the economy softens, and you mentioned that some people are talking about a, a softening March, early April, uh, that is another reason for us to cut rates uh, uh, unless inflation is, let's say, out of control. They really have to look at both of those. And I found those words to be very encouraging in terms of uh, forward action for the Fed. So I'm shaking my head, Kier, because this is just utterly ridiculous. The fact that anybody would want to buy stocks based upon what the Fed might or might not do is just absolutely foolish. Absolutely foolish. You should never make your investment decisions based upon what you think the Fed is going to maybe do or not do in the future. That is just, you're, you're messing up in a big way if you're playing the game that way. That should have nothing to do with your investing decisions. You should be looking at companies, finding out what companies have great growth and our safe business models have great income statements, balance sheets, or trading at the right valuation so you're not getting ripped off on a stock, and making your investment decisions that way. Not, hmm, I wonder if the Fed's going to lower next month or not. Oh, you didn't know what they're not, so let me not buy stocks. Oh, they are also... No, no, okay, no. That's not the way this game is played. The only time you should ever be impacted in terms of making a buying or selling decision based upon interest rates, let's call it, is if you're in, in some sort of situation where Fed funds rate is like 9%, 10%, because then at that time you could get probably 8 9% on savings accounts, CD account products, things like that, which is kind of what you usually expect from like an S&P 500 return. So if you had some sort of Fed funds rate approaching a double-digit percentage, then you could actually make buying and selling decisions based upon where the Fed interest rates are at. Because then you could say, you know what, I don't want to buy. I'd rather just have money in a savings account. Since we're in the fives, it still makes sense to buy stocks. But once again, if the Fed went up crazy higher than they are now, then that would make sense to put money in cash rather than uh, stocks at that particular time. But outside of that freak event, which we haven't really seen that since, what, the 1970s? 1980, something like that. We haven't seen a double-digit Fed funds rate since, you know, yeah, 70s, early 80s. And so unless you're in one of those situations, like, come on, man, like, like that's just utterly ridiculous. Next one up here. The spike in the VIX this month hasn't been unexpected. This should be interesting. Spiking over the past month. We now uh, see it at 19, really almost 20. Waking more up. on the VIX and the fear up. that happens, that appears to be gripping Wall Street. Let's bring in Mandy Su, the head of derivative uh, market intelligence at CBOE Global Markets. Mandy, great to see you. Great to be here, Melissa. Um, so what does the VIX tell you right now? Because it seems like the positioning right now by traders is that there is an anticipation of even higher volatility going forward. Correct. So yes, the VIX has spiked higher this month, but I wouldn't call it unexpected in the sense that all throughout Q1, despite very, very low volatility, we started seeing traders build up positions in VIX, particularly VIX upside calls, kind of playing for this change in the volatility um, uh, regime. And that's exactly what we've gotten. 
Now, what I'm watching for here is, you know, really for VIX to go higher, we really need to see significant escalation on the geopolitical front, mm-hmm. which, as we heard from Richard, maybe not going to happen. Um, And then just more uncertainty, more turmoil on the um, macroeconomic front. And on both cases, you know, if you look, for example, in the rates market, what stands out to me is that rates volatility actually has been relatively muted despite the surge higher that we've seen in yields, very different from last fall, where as rates were going higher, rates volatility was much, much more elevated, signaling there was just a lot more uncertainty about the path you know, of, of rates. Mm-hmm. I think this time around, yes, we're talking about a delay in terms of Fed cuts, but the policy direction is still one way. It's still going to be uh. cutting, right? So I think until we get meaningful risk of potential hike, I, I, you know, that's what I'm watching for in terms of, you know, rates volatility spilling over mm-hmm. into equity vol taking VIX higher. You haven't even mentioned earnings season. We're just <laughs> at the start of it. Netflix being the first of the big cap tech to report, and, and that was disappointing. At least that's what we're seeing uh, in the pre-market. What are you expecting uh, here? Wait. Take a- well, hold your horsies. Hold your horsies. Netflix was not disappointing. Those numbers were incredible, Netflix reported. They are phenomenal. Like, 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 this, this not, if the stock price goes one way, it doesn't mean the, the earnings were bad. That's not how this works. The earnings for Netflix were phenomenal. As we see semis, which had been a leader in tech, I mean, semis are about 20% of the NASDAQ, yeah. in correction territory. NVIDIA, the leader there, yeah. is in correction territory as well. Uh, Exactly. So I think this earnings season is going to be very important. I think especially as the macroeconomic environment turns more challenging, um, I think we really need you know, earnings to not just beat, but beat significantly in order you know, for the um, rally to continue. And what we're seeing in the derivatives market is that options and uh, traders are pricing in a lot more single stock volatility. So the idiosyncratic risk that is being priced into the market in excess of the VIX is at almost the highest on record. So people are expecting this earnings season to be one of that was most meaningful or most impactful um, on record. Wow. Where are you seeing the most bets within, I'm, I'm just curious, like within technology, for instance? I mean, it, it's not surprising. It's, you know, the NVIDIAs, kind of the leaders mm-hmm. that we've seen uh, where we do see kind of the biggest, um, you know, uh, increase in terms of option activity, the biggest increase in terms of volatility. That's, t- that's where kind of investors have been focused on, where NVIDIA goes, kind of the rest of the sector almost, you know. The expectations that will go. Are you getting the sense that investors are making directional bets using options or if they're hedging a position? Um, I think in VIX, it's, it's primarily hedging. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's interesting is the theme this year is that people have been gravitating away from traditional hedges and say S&P puts, your traditional right. portfolio hedges, towards volatility hedges, right. towards VIX. Um, and I think that's a function of both kind of lower levels of vol, so the potential yes. for vol to explode. 100%. When you know, VIX is at 15 versus, say, VIX at 20, then to double, yep. triple, obviously, it takes a much bigger catalyst. But also yep. a function of positioning, right, as people pile into equities they build up their positioning, that need for hedging um, increases. And right now, people kind of gravitating 100%. towards VIX. And, you know, very notably, last Friday, when we did get the VIX pop, we had, you know, I think over 2.6 million contracts trade on that day in VIX options, higher than what we saw in March 2020 during the pandemic, which I thought was pretty incredible. Where do you think VIX wait, ends up? Wait, wait. So what? my expectation... You know, I think over 2.6 million contracts trade on that day in VIX options, higher than what we saw in March 2020 during the pandemic, which I thought was pretty incredible. That's insane. Where do you think VIX ends insane. up? Insane. So my expectation, at least for the near term, is that we stay in this newer range of like 15 to 20. So, you know, <laughs> mid to high teens. I don't see us kind of breaking out into the... <laughs> I'll tell you why I'm laughing. This is insane. 30 range until something <laughs> kind of more serious on the macroeconomic front emerges. But I do think right now there is enough uncertainty with kind of direction of Fed policy and, and inflation and obviously earnings to keep, you know, VIX in this 15 to 20 range. That is my expectation for the near term. I'm laughing here. This is hilarious because now we've got people pr- trying to predict the VIX. Like what? You can't do that. Like, that's, not how, that's not how it works at all. The VIX... At the end of the day, if things come out that everybody gets freaked out over and it's like black swan type events or you know, a horrible CPI number or a horrible PCE number or whatever, horrible PPI number um, that's way, way too elevated, like those sorts of things can spike the VIX huge. And so to try to make a, an assessment or judgment on where the VIX is going to be trading out at is impossible because there's way too many factors that go into that. You don't know what's going to happen with Iran, 
Israel, you don't know what Russia could do or not do. Like, like you don't know what the CPI is going to be at or the PPI. Or you don't know if all of a sudden, you know, Meta reports a horrible quarter or Apple reports a horrible quarter or whatever stock or NVIDIA all of a sudden talks about not as strong of a guidance. Like, you, you can't, it's impossible. You can't predict all those things. And so to try to guess where the VIX is going to be at, it's just like, that, that's, a, that's a silly, silly, silly game in my personal opinion. Next one up here. Markets are following NVIDIA's lead. Kerry Feinerstone, this should be interesting. Right now, again, futures lower, but pulling back from, you know, steeper lows earlier right after these attacks. Uh, let's see where market's trading at right now, because it's been all over the place. It would open lower, then it came back, then it was lower. Let's see where, where things are trading at here. So Russell's actually green. The Russell Wilson's green. We have... The NASDAQ down pretty big today, about 1.4%. Vaunt, Planet having great days. Nordstrom having a good day. SoFi having a good day. Shopify, Cake, PayPal all green. But then Elf on a Shelf down big today. NVIDIA down big. What is this, a growth day down? Uh, Meta down big. Amazon down big. Interesting. Well, big is relative for those ones. Um, okay, intriguing, intriguing. I'll probably have a video coming on the main channel tonight goes in depth on tech for next well, week. Well, Frank, I think it's a sign of the level of the reaction. It was, as Israel characterized it, a weak response. It was not an all-out military effort. And I think the market should feel relieved about that. The market has been jittery, which is my word, and very concerned about the escalation of this war between Israel and Iran. And for Israel to have essentially detonated Iran's military action, and now whatever has happened here has not resulted in much destruction, if any, because it has not been reported yet, I think is a very good sign for the world and for the market. Okay, let's get back to the markets. Um, tech's been under quite a bit of pressure. It seems like it started when we saw a change in outlook when it comes to the Fed, when it came to the Fed rate cuts. But I know you're watching one stock in particular that you now say is probably the most important one in the market. It's Nvidia. Um, technically in correction territory, still up about seventy percent year to date, but in correction territory and trading lower this morning. These moves in Nvidia. What does it say to you about the broader market? Well, the market has been following Nvidia more or less. Remember. We were up 27% from late October until April 1st, driven by the AI march, and NVIDIA is the leader of that march. Now with NVIDIA weakening, and it grew to the third largest market capitalization company in the world, up to over 5% market cap, that's a sign that we're calming down the euphoria. I know it's been phenomenal for NVIDIA. It still doesn't trade at a very hefty multiple, but you can't mm. have just forward march without recognizing that the rest of artificial okay. intelligence has not been one of profit making as it is for NVIDIA. NVIDIA sells the chips. Everyone else buys the chips. And for slowing down here of this it. stock, it's just a sign that the rest of the market has to regroup. Yeah, but but here's the thing, okay? So NVIDIA is the infrastructure. They're building the highways, right, for, for these companies. They're giving them uh, – maybe that's not even the best uh, way to put it. I'd actually kind of say Meta is more of the highways, and what Amazon's doing are kind of more of the highways. And obviously Microsoft might be more of the highways. Uh, Microsoft might be more of the buildings for the city. I would say NVIDIA is the – all the commodities, that you need to build the highways, right? I would say um, Nvidia is, is the dump trucks <laughs> to to bring to bring in all the, the gravel and whatnot, right? That's what Nvidia is. And so, without Nvidia, you can't you can't build the highway. You can't build the buildings that go in the city and things like that. And so, it all starts with the commodities at first, right? And that's basically Nvidia, although their products aren't very commoditized, right? So. NVIDIA is that, and then we're starting to see, you'll start to see in 2024, the highway companies, and even some of the ones that are building the buildings in the city, you'll start to see some of those actually benefit this year as well. You already started to see a glimpse of it last quarter with a company like a Palantir, right? You're going to see it and hear it a lot more in, in Microsoft's numbers. Wait till Amazon comes out. I think Amazon reports not this coming week, but next week. Uh, wait to see, hear what Amazon has to say about AWS and some growth there. They might 
they'll probably be re reporting the best growth they've had in several years for AWS in 2024 overall. So I think you're going to start to see other people benefit from AI outside of just NVIDIA. NVIDIA was really the only one who seemed to benefit last year. This year, you're going to start to see the Palantirs, the Microsofts, the Amazons, and the Metas, and many others start to benefit from, from AI. But keep in mind, this is still like early, early like in the cycle of the AI story. So whatever numbers these companies post, it's actually small, small potatoes, as they would say. Small potatoes compared to what will be transpiring three years from now, five years from now, seven years from now, 15 years from now. Okay, so that's just a little food for thought in regards to that. We're still, we're still way early in this game. All right, so, so much to talk about, but can't leave without getting your WEX word of the day. What is it and why? Yeah, well, that word is jittery, and I gave it to you yesterday. I mean, today would be another example. We are, uh, the market and investors are waiting to find out, number one, if we have very good earnings. I mean, the market is up, multiples are up. We have to have earnings that justify the price of the stocks. Okay, let's just cut her off. Let's just, just cut her off. Um, so the market, jittery, all these sorts of things. I think it's more investors are jittery, or certainly not investors, traders are jittery. I don't think investors are jittery, um, at least not really any I know. You know, we're all pretty calm, cool, and collected, looking for deals out there saying, hey, you want to send stocks down? Give me some of these stocks. You want to send Tesla under 150? Give me Tesla shares under 150. You want to send Nike under 100? Give me some shares of Nike under 100, right? So I think that's us. And, and by the way, I made a video on the main channel last night that went really into depth on 13 stocks that uh, I think are deals, great buys right now. And so I think it's more of the traders. I've kind of gone a little bit sideways, maybe gone a little more towards shorting, uh, maybe positioned out a little bit. Maybe they're jittery because if you're a trader, you got to worry about all this stuff. You know, if all of a sudden some black swan event happens and you're a trader and you're on the wrong side of that, you get destroyed quickly. And, you, you know, if you're positioned wrong, it, it's very, very painful. If you're an investor, you're like, who cares? Like, I'm worried about the next three, five, seven, ten years. Whatever's happening short term doesn't matter to me. If you're a trader, what's going on in the short term is everything to you. So there's just such a different mentality there. And so I don't like it if they say investors are jittery. No, it's not investors. It's traders are jittery. There's a big difference, okay? Appreciate you guys. Thanks for being here as always. We're now, I think it's 150 plus deep for 1,000x watch list. So if you're looking to join the, or not watch list, the wait list. If you want to join the wait list for 1,000x, you can go to 1,000xstocks.com. Join the wait list there. I think we're, yeah, I think we're like 150 plus on the wait list now at this point in time. Much love and have a great day.